Journalist John Swartz joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss journalism and climate science. After two decades at the New York Times, John has joined the faculty at the University of Texas School of Journalism as a professor of practice concentrating on climate science. UT has been very good to me, and it turns out that I love teaching, and, uh, and the students are great. And it's also not a bad thing to be trying to launch people into the world of journalism, and especially uh, I'm teaching uh, a course in covering climate, covering the environment, and I really feel it's important to get people into that field, especially into the science communication, climate communication field, and uh, and have them be good at it, and have them come from, you know, not necessarily the Ivy Leagues, but from every part of the country. And so uh, doing this from Texas is especially satisfying. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Plutopia News Network. I'm John Lubkowski, one of your cheerful co-hosts. Uh, and my partner in crime over there is Scoop Sweeney. And our contributing editor and contributing genius is Wendy Grossman. And our guest today is John Schwartz who is currently a professor of practice in journalism at the UT Austin School of Journalism Media and an associate director of UT's new Global Sustainability Leadership Institute. But John has a history as a journalist and editor over the years. He's worked for Newsweek, Washington Post, and the New York Times. He's also written several books, including Oddly Normal, One Family's Struggle to Help Their Teenage Son Come to Terms with His Sexuality, and this is the year I put my financial life in order, which is what I keep saying. So, John, welcome. Welcome to the much. Plutopia uh, realm. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the first questions for you is to say more about what you're doing there at UT. Well, um, after 21 years at the New York Times, with the last seven years um, being involved with the with the newspaper's climate coverage, uh, I had uh, reached uh, the ripe old age of 64 and uh, and uh, wondered, um, had been wondering whether there was a next act. Uh, UT called and asked if I would like to join the faculty here teaching journalism as a, as a practitioner. The professor of practice thing is you were in the trade and so now you can teach the trade, uh, as opposed to being an academic researcher. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's to put me in contact with students and and show them the ropes. So uh, so I had to think hard about that. I have family in Texas. Uh, I'd already lost my dad. Uh, my mom was in memory care, but uh, but I loved seeing her and uh, was still calling her every night you know, and, and uh, having a good conversation. Anyway, all of that sort of said, um, when UT called with the opportunity to come home, uh, it made a lot of sense to me. And, um, and so uh, I said, yes. Uh, unfortunately, mom didn't survive till we made the move, but it got me here into back to Texas with uh, where I've got my daughter and her two kids uh and and her ex so we've got family here and i've got brothers in houston and the whole idea was um uh, make make a move and and try another career while somebody might still want me to launch another career and uh, and ut has been very good to me and it turns out that i love teaching and uh and the students are great and it's also not a bad thing to be trying to launch people into the world of journalism and especially uh, I'm teaching uh, a course in covering climate, covering the environment. And I really feel it's important to get people into that field, especially into the science communication, climate communication field and, uh, and have them be good at it and have them come from, you know, not necessarily the Ivy Leagues, but from every part of the country. And so uh, doing this from Texas 
is especially satisfying. Yeah, I know UT has a really excellent uh, School of Communications and Journalism program, and I tend to uh, attend the annual International Symposium on Online Journalism that Rosenthal Alvis does there. Um, so it's a great place to be, but I, I kind of wonder if you experienced any kind of culture shock moving back to Texas from New York. Can I just say that your accent sounds much more Texan than it did when I used to see you in New York? It's hilarious. Yeah, it did, it did come back pretty strong, didn't it? Um, you know, Austin's very changed. There, there's no surprise there. Everybody, everybody knows that Austin has changed. Uh, my wife and I don't recognize the skyline at all. Uh, but the fact is, my parents were living in Austin until the very end of their lives. And so about a year or two before the end of their lives. So we were coming back to Austin all the time. I had gone to UT, but then a couple of times, few times a year, we were we were back seeing them, visiting with family. And so it's it's not like I was completely unprepared for what happened to Austin in that time. Um, and the state's politics, uh, I was keeping up with. It's a little shock to be here in the middle of it, as opposed to as opposed to sort of staring at it open mouthed from afar. But uh, but it's been um, but but it's not like again this this came out of the blue. Uh, I and and I was still reading the Texas Observer, reading the Texas Tribune, reading Texas Monthly. So uh, I was keeping up with Texas politics in a way maybe that other people who have moved away from home weren't. And a lot of that is because my dad had been a state senator and I grew up in the state's politics. And, you know, my, my, uh, I think my first grade show and tell project was interviewing Governor John Connolly. Uh, so, you know, this, this would have been uh, interesting. Uh, it was, it was, it was a good talk. Um, it was a good talk. I I was stuck in Austin for the day and I was at my dad's office. So I just wandered up to the governor's office and asked if I could talk to him. Fantastic. Yeah. How and long the, was the uh, interview? I didn't know I was gonna be a I didn't know I was gonna be a journalist, but the fact is the receptionist said, Well, he's very busy. And I said, That's okay, I'll wait. Which is basically <laughs> basically been my approach ever since. Yeah, that's a good approach. I I wonder about the students that you have there at at the university. There is a lot of uh, sort of, uh, I guess, gloom and drama around the state of journalism these days. Do you have journalism students that are really fired up who actually think they can build a career in an environment that's kind of difficult for journalists? I have students who are building a career. I mean, they're they're here. And they're working for the American statesman. They're writing for all kinds of publications. They're going off and getting jobs. Not everybody's going to get a job in journalism. You re really got to burn to do it. But um, but uh, but I'm seeing people giving it a try. A, a career in journalism wasn't a sure thing when I started either. And I had to set some goals for myself with my wife and say, I don't really think that it's possible to get a good job in journalism, but you know, let's give it a shot. And if uh, if I don't have a, a real job with a dental plan in five years, then you know, the, I had gotten a law degree by then too. I said I'll 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 come home and I'll do divorces. It'll be fine. Well, you dodged a bullet. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to well, be a very good lawyer. Um, I've got I've got two brothers who are lawyers, and they're very good at it. And I was just going to be. You know, I just wasn't going to be it's pretty clear to me. I wasn't going to be very good at it, but um, but you know, the the, uh, the the students that I'm having my classes now have an even more troubled environment that they're trying to get into. But I believe if they really burn to tell these stories, uh, they they can they can find a place. And if they don't, they can do divorces. Well, a large number of the students, a large number of the students in my classes tell me that they want to go to law school, that they actually want to be lawyers, but being 
uh, journal being a journalism major gives them uh, helps train them to write clearly mm. and simply. And uh, and if that's what they want, I want to help them do it because lawyers don't. And and if that's you know, um, and I urge them to take other you know use their electives in the liberal arts and round themselves out. But uh, but the the fact is. Um, this is a this is a pretty portable degree, and I'm happy to teach anybody who wants to sit in my classroom. And uh, and I've got a student who uh, just wandered off and got a job as a as a, one of the very few reporters at uh, at a newspaper in the British Virgin Islands. And he'd had he'd had lots of things he wanted to do, and then he found out about this job, and he asked me to recommend him, and so he's out there reporting in paradise. And I don't have any complaints about that. My observation has been that also that, you know, when people say journalism is in a dire state, what they mean is the commercially the commercial business model of journalism, not journalism itself. And, um, you know, there are a lot of ways for people to make money or to, to make a living from from journalism that are not working for a newspaper or, or a commercial publication. Um, you know, NGOs hire hire journalists now and acad a lot of academic careers seem to me more like what journalists used to do than they do like what the way I think of, of academic careers, too. Yeah. Um, and, I think that's absolutely right, Wendy. And the other thing, you know, the, the other thing about lawyers is it's always struck me that the closest profession to that of lawyer is literary critic. <laughs> it always seems to me lawyers spend a lot of time reading stuff and analyzing it and trying to find the loopholes and stuff. And uh, but but lawyers also, you know, when I was in college, I had no idea that a lawyer could be an activist and that, you know, we all knew about, as you say, divorces, but actually a law degree, you might work for ACLU, you might work for Electronic Frontier Foundation, you might work for, you know, look at Lena Khan working for the, you know, Federal Trade Commission and, and, and changing how we handle antitrust. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different careers there. Yeah, I didn't mean to make light of what could be done with a with a with a law degree. You could do a lot of good with a law degree. Not that I was going to, but uh, <laughs> but but uh, but people with talent and drive can can uh, can move the world. You mentioned I, earlier I, that uh, the the importance of teaching uh, your students to uh, cover the climate issues that are so important right now. Your dad was very big in defending the environment. I was uh, working in the media in Houston. I remember he brought up a lot of a lot of issues that I wasn't aware of. No one really paid attention to what was going on with the climate, with the environment. Did that uh, influence you at all in your current views on in protecting the environment and climate change? Absolutely. I mean, that's dad. Dad, you know, was not only my hero; he was a real inspiration. Uh, when I when I started covering environmental issues, you know, he was a great resource for me. But more important than that, he liked the fact that I was doing it. We and we could have conversations about uh, coastal restoration, coastal protection. Um, I mean, you know, sediment transport. Just think about kicking back with your dad and talking about sediment transport. It's uh, it was you know the fact that that uh, that we could nerd out together on some of these issues and uh and protecting fisheries and uh and you know going out to get seafood and talking about dad's efforts to uh to protect fisheries to um to restrict fishing of uh of for instance the redfish so that uh so that there would be redfish in the future all of that uh, dad dad a lot of dad's legislation was to make sure that there was public access to Texas beaches. And you know, that was that was just a huge deal for me to know that my dad had tried to make sure that the beaches weren't just for rich people who had houses on the beach, but that anybody could walk the length of, of Galveston Island. That all meant a lot to me. And then 
uh, it also gave me perspective. One of the reasons that they, you know, one of the reasons I put my hand up for hurricane coverage at the New York Times over the years was that um, was that I had experienced hurricanes as a child, and that dad's, you know, dad's love of the Gulf Coast um, was, was in me. So, you know, uh, but also a kind of a sense of perspective that. Uh, that a lot of other reporters don't have because, uh, you know, dad was an environmentalist, but he was also a realist. And uh, when, when after the BP oil spill, people were, you know, tremendously upset about oil blobs landing on beaches and the dam the damage that these little uh, nuggets of of, uh, of tar, the tar balls, would cause. Um, and it was terrible, of course, but uh, but I couldn't help but remember that you know my dad, the great environmentalist, just kept a can of turpentine by the by the breezeway on the way into our house, and because uh, when we went to the beach, our feet were going to get tar on them, you know, because natural seeps and and little bits of oil, large amounts of oil falling out of ships as they lightered on their way into the ship channel. Uh, all of that meant that there was no perfectly pristine beach. And uh, and that sense of perspective sort of helped me understand that, you know, when my parents, when we, you know, when we were on the beach and if I pointed at a tar ball, my parents didn't panic. They said, yeah, that's a tar ball. Don't eat it. You know that that uh, and and don't track it into that and don't track this stuff into the house. So um, I don't know if that made me a better reporter, but it made me a reporter with a little different perspective. That uh, about you know about how how to live with um, how to live with all of this and and where to you know and and where the and where the real crises are. You know that 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 if this is if this is done, it's it's you know it's terrible. It has to be cleaned up, but um, but you know but we can also deal with it and move on to the the problems of climate change and you know and everything else that we have to tackle. You know, that was a very long and wandering answer to well, what I it, thought was a simple question. It was a great answer, and I remember what <clears throat> pardon me when I was living and working in Houston at that time. The Houston Ship Channel had a problem of uh, catching fire. I mean, we had a, a a ship channel that was blazing, and I uh, remember that uh, Babe Schwartz was just in the news about yeah, this is ridiculous. It's coming down at Galveston. Why are you people doing that in Houston? And Houston's uh, government uh, under Louis Welch was just like, well, it's just the way it is, and so <laughs> they had a lot. Yeah. Of a lot well, of the, words between him and the uh, uh, the Houston uh, uh, political uh, bosses like Louis Welch. Yeah, Dad's Dad's principles were outstanding. His belief in open beaches, his uh, his care for the environment and how people are affected by it, uh, his his care for you know the the the, the very species of of uh, marine life and everything he tried to do. But his defining characteristic was how pissed off he got and how he expressed himself when he was pissed off. And so, you know, the, the, the beauty of Babe Schwartz was that he was always on fire uh, and got things done through the through the, uh, you know, through the the um, how loud he yelled and and his choice of words and you know he could go from outrage to ridicule and it was a it was an important lesson in um what we might call environmental communication <laughs> that, we, that, <laughs> we need more honest politicians that are pissed off that's for yeah, sure exactly. especially in dealing with climate change did molly uh, ivans ever write about your father Oh yeah, yeah. Um, in uh, in Molly Ivans can't say that, can she? She uh, I have that book. book. Hmm. I have that book. Okay. Well, Dad's in there. I believe that's the book in which she calls him a gray maned pixie, uh, <laughs> and and uh, and and talked about uh, 
some of his speeches because in describing the legislature as the best free show in town, um, she she uh, liked dad and 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 dad liked her, you know, and uh, and I, I mom always loved telling the story of this tall gal showing up at the house. I think she said she was tall and barefoot. But anyway, uh, she showed up at the house and mom answered the door and she said, Babe said I could crash here for a few days. <laughs> it was, uh, during during the old times of the Texas Observer and things like that before she was, you know, Molly Ivins. But uh, she always just was, you know, uh, she and dad were, you know, were great together and, and had fun. And uh, and she was very kind to me because of the connection with mom and dad. Does her calling him a great what was a green maned pixie? Mm -hmm. Should I derive from that that your father was not much taller than you are? Dad was definitely taller than I am, but <laughs> uh, but everybody is taller than I am, and Dad was about five seven, I think. Um, there was a wonderful moment toward the end of his life when we were walking together in the hospital, and one of my brothers realized we were finally the same height, because uh, because he had. He had lost some height. It was just wonderful. It was a wonderful moment for me anyway. Dad didn't seem as pleased. <laughs> I bet. But uh, but 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 yeah, that was uh, Molly was uh, was just, you know, uh, was terrific to know because of all those connections between dad and, and some of the some of the really great journalists uh, really. Um, really just helped me to feel right in journalism you know that that uh that that I came in with a sense that uh you know reading the people who were doing amazing things that that they were not on a pedestal they could be known he uh, ran uh an interesting uh bit of political theater in 1979 when he helped lead the killer bees that was an impressive tactic that uh, has been tried since then but uh, i believe that must have been the first time that you know the uh, the mass walkout of the senators <laughs> brought yes. the government to a halt the the use of a quorum break to to block a vote um that was the most famous for a long time it was not the first time dad told another story about a quorum break some years before and to tell you how long it was before the the killer bees i believe the killer bees was 79 or 80 uh would have been i think it would have been 79 cuz um cuz that would have been the session but uh but um it was it was some years before because dad remembered that they all hid out in the AFL CIO building across the street from or, or a couple of blocks away from the capitol and dad remembered that uh, somebody brought a guitar and they were playing and Barbara Jordan sang along. And he said that she had a beautiful voice and he hadn't known she had a beautiful voice. Uh, Not really surprising, I guess. I mean, as a speaker, she had a beautiful voice. I guess absolutely. singing but, as well. But holding a tune? Come on. Yeah, singing, singing, yeah, yeah. Great singing voice and great speaking voice don't always go together. As our resident folk singer points out. <laughs> so... so yeah, so having having those people around me, you know, that uh, because Dad was a member of the state senate when I was ten or eleven or twelve, um, um, I uh, I was, and because we would be living in Austin during this during the sessions of the legislature, uh, I could work as a page in the House of Representatives. And so because they had these pages who were little kids, but it was mainly, you know, Austin people. And and so um, and so I grew up very familiar with the building and with the people. And somebody in the house would call over a page and would hand me a note and say, take that to Barbara Jordan. And so, you know, I would then run from the House side to the Senate side and go on the Senate floor and hand the note to Barbara, by God, Jordan. You know, State <laughs> Senator Barbara Jordan, and uh, and so growing up seeing these people again, 
I had a sense of awe about them even then, but they were also within reach. And that's helped me a lot. When I got to Washington as a reporter and was being introduced to members of the of Congress, to senators, um, I both had a, had a leg up in understanding what they do because I'd been involved with government as a little boy, but, uh, but also um, I didn't think that they were somehow out of reach. In fact, I never met a member of the House of Representatives or the Senate in an interview who I thought was smarter than my dad. You know, they, they, they were all of a human scale. Did you ever want to do politics yourself? Dad wanted me to. <laughs> yeah, but you, were you like, did it tend to make you more interested in doing politics? Or I guess, obviously, it made you more interested in writing about politics. Uh, when I was a kid, I I didn't yearn to do it. You know, it wasn't high up there. It wasn't like astronaut. Um you know, it, uh, but, but it was something that I thought I might be able to do. It's just that, uh, well, it just really did look like a lot of work. <laughs> I, bet, I bet it is a lot of work. Well, the, the I kind of wonder now, I mean, now it's more like performance. It seems yeah. that a lot of politicians now aren't trying to do the actual work of governing, but they're more in to a kind of show business thing, sort of like trying to do stand-up comedy or something. I don't really yeah. know. What Were you about. not aware at the time that being an astronaut is a lot of work? Uh, it, it, yeah, but they got to dress so nice. <laughs> In pampers. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to be prepared. But, but, uh, but the, thing about, the, the thing about dad and the people of that time, they worked together. They actually understood the workings of government. My dad wrote out bills longhand, um, and and uh, and his legislation, uh, you know, he got beat in 1980, and then continued to hang out around the Capitol as a lobbyist for decades afterward. He he died at 92, and uh, was still working the Capitol as a lobbyist uh, at 90. So, um, so in those decades, uh, he would propose, you know, legislation for somebody to carry for his, uh, for his various clients, uh, none of whom were evil, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and it would go up to the enrolling and engrossing office where, you know, people brought in their, their bills and, you know, they were put together by teams of researchers that had been vetted by lawyers and experts. And dads were just as good because he saw around corners. And I would sit with him, he'd talk about some bill, he'd, he'd hear about a bill and he'd look it up and he'd say, yeah, you know, this bill is designed in such a way that it allows municipal utility districts to do a lot more than I think people expect them to be able to do. And it's right here. And he, he sort of, he could he could take the lid off and look at the clockwork and know what each gear did and uh, and those were the kind of skills that i think a lot of these people don't have now they're you know they yeah. much rather be tweeting a political point than governing absolutely what would what would he think of the bunch that we have now well he survived mm -hmm. long enough to know you know to know of a lot of them and he didn't have much respect. Yeah. He, he, he griped about him and was, uh, um, and was very vocal. I'd like to shift gears a little bit <clears throat> and talk about journalism um, more. Yeah. But we're having so much fun. I know. This is actually great. I could talk about this all day. We should, we should do one of these again and, and dig deeper into political history of Texas, especially. Texas is kind of a fascinating state politically. It is. Oh, by the way, well, before we move on, and I'm happy to move on and talk about journalism, uh, Wendy, the, the, the big Texas political book of the moment is Mr. Texas by Lawrence Wright. And, uh, and it's a, it's a terrific novel. It's a real novel. Um, and, uh, and, uh, 
And he put dad in as a minor character. Dude, I always He's, find it sort of, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a fan of making fiction, fiction with real, I don't, I don't like fiction, fictionalizing real people because I always figure they're going to, there's going to be something that is not, re, that is not actually real. And then it's going to be stuck in my head and I'm not very good at history anyway, but do, how do you feel about it as his son? Uh, well, first of all, um, I feel the same way. Uh, my wife is a real stickler about it as a, as a person with a master's in history. And, you know, and we both loved Hilary Mantel's Cromwell series, but she was always bothered by the fact that it wasn't Cromwell. Oh, yeah. I always man. make an ex I always make an exception for James Goldman's play Lion in Winter. Okay. <laughs> I right. mean, I, I know the history is terrible. I don't care. Catherine Hepburn, Peter O'Toole, and Anthony Hopkins. What more exactly. do you want? Come on. Uh, Dad is not a character, a, 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 a character in the novel. That is, he's not engaging with people. He is described as an early mentor for one of the okay, that for, makes for sense. one of the uh, for one of the characters, in the same way that uh, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick is referred to as the worst thing to happen to Texas politics in decades. Who's the current governor? Greg Abbott. Yeah. Who is the, who is the one that Molly Ivins always called uh, Governor Goodhair? Governor Goodhair. Governor Goodhair was Rick Perry, who went on to become the energy secretary for uh, for Trump. Yeah. I, knew, I knew I had seen his <clears throat> somewhere and was going, really? <laughs> he was the energy secretary that didn't know what the energy department did, I think. Yeah, it's kind of famous for that. But I, I kind of figure that if Lawrence Wright writes uh, fiction, it's not really fiction, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty remarkable book. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm looking anyway, forward but, to reading. But I just, since we we're talking about dad in books, that's the most recent uh, dad sort of photo bombing a narrative. Well, the question I was, my first question about journalism uh, is just how you think the role of the journal or whether you think the role of the journalist has changed over the last like decade or two? Well, of course it has, and sometimes not fast enough. One of the good things about being a climate journalist was that, uh, was that uh, we were very science-based and we had to dig into the substance of the science and learn it and make judgments. Uh, in a way that politics, which tends to uh, scape the surfaces of things very often can't or doesn't. And so um, in covering climate change, my, uh, my colleagues and I at the Times, we, we, we built up a climate desk in 2014. And uh, there had been climate reporting at the paper for actually for decades we put james hansen warning congress that climate change was already happening this was 1988 and it was on the front page of the new york times so uh so it, it wasn't new to the topic but the idea of building our own our own um our own team in a in a really profound way was new and i was uh and i was part of that group and the first thing we did as as colleagues, uh, Justin Gillis, who had been covering climate change beautifully for, for quite some time, said, this is not a two side story that we're not going to engage in balancing a side that has the scientific facts against a side that just has bullshit. And so uh, so Justin's point was, we don't have to call the Heartland Institute, which denies the science of climate change whenever we write about climate change, because the fact that humans are causing warming and the fact that the warming is increasing and the fact that we're in trouble are are now simply you know facts and there are lots of issues with two sides but uh but uh but we don't have to play the game we don't have to engage in false balance uh, because because this much has been established. And then when we get to real controversies, like what is the role of nuclear in the grid? What is the role of natural gas in the grid? Is there a possible role for uh, things like geoengineering to, uh, you know, in case things get so bad 
you know, can can drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere work? And is it advisable? Can uh, can distributing sulfur particles in the upper atmosphere to reduce the amount of solar uh, the amount of light hitting the planet uh, is that is that a ridiculous idea is it something that has to be put behind the in case of emergency break glass case you know those are real controversies with multiple sides and we report it like the controversy it is but is climate change happening no we know it is and uh and that was uh and that was a change from how climate change had been covered in and that's mainstream journalism sense? What? Did, that, did that stance get you a lot of abuse from readers? Um, sometimes. I mean, yeah, I had people. Uh, they would they would send me insulting emails and stuff. But um, but I'm I'm very accustomed to uh, abusive uh, and ignorant emails. I mean, my mailbag uh, had to be lined with asbestos, so I didn't I didn't really worry about that. And uh, it, the 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 funny you know the 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 funny result of that is that when I teach my students about disinformation and give them lots of background in in how disinformation is distributed and what the tools of disinformation are, I just had them I, I regularly have them do an exercise uh, in which they incorporate disinformation tools in a note to me that we read. To the class and you know i invite them to use cherry picking false experts conspiracy theories just whatever else uh but also i advise them strongly to uh lean into ad hominem attack for entertainment value uh and uh and you know and and we then hold the class and we and each person reads the uh the pieces aloud and you know if if somebody wants to say I don't, it, it, it's all about whether I should give them a better grade or not. It's like urging me to give them a good grade. And when somebody writes to me, as somebody did in the spring, I don't see why I should listen to somebody who's not tall enough to ride the roller coaster. Um, <laughs> you know, I was howling. That's and so, definitely an ad hominem. And it was, it, definitely it was helps. That, what? It definitely helps to have a sense of humor. I mean, you know, yeah, Absolutely. but they said, how can you take this? I said, you should read my mail. <laughs> yeah, actually, I can imagine. Actually, have you thought about, actually, have you thought about having them read your mail? Uh, I, I did. The first couple of semesters, I worked through my old mailbag and I said, okay, let's identify the, uh, you know, let's look through some of these and let's identify. And I called it John's mail mailbag. Um, and I could come back to it, but A, I felt that it wasn't, I, f I felt that 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 the people writing to me weren't good enough writers <laughs> to um to to help make the points I was trying to make right that that uh, that I, I it, it it wasn't really that effective and the other thing was that stuff is now two and a half to five years old and while while I do present them some studies that are four or five years old that I wrote about at the time to show them what the study said and how I covered it. I try to keep the old stuff to a minimum. I try to I try to have them see new things. And so I felt my mailbag was maybe a little self-indulgent and uh, and was starting to get a whiff of mothballs off of it. I think with climate change, the the issue is been less and less whether climate change is happening and more whether climate change is anthropogenic. And then if you accept that it's anthropogenic, that humans are causing it, what do we do to fix it? And, you know, the answer to that question is that we really need to radically change the way that we live uh, and especially the way that we use fossil fuels and that upsets people in the fossil fuel industry, but it also means that people will will have uh, a disruption to a lifestyle that we've come to accept. And I kind of understand why 
why people are riled about it, though it's a, a short sightedness that that is problematic. And I well, guess yeah, I understand your point, but really uh, a lot of the a lot of the disruptions are are um are overstated for political effect. If 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 renewables replace the coal plant, um that might actually turn out better for your power bill. You know, if if renewables um buffered by uh by battery storage replace most of the coal burning and natural gas plants in the country over time, uh it's you know when I flick the switch, the light's still going to come on. And if my bill doesn't triple, then, you know, then it's not going to have a strong impact on my life. So if I, if an electric car is better than a, than a conventional gasoline fueled car, and if I can buy it for a reasonable amount of money, which is what happens when the learning curve drives down the, the the cost of producing these cars in the United States. Give me that car. You know, you don't have to be a tree hugger to want a Tesla, though I don't want to give money to Elon Musk. I sure <laughs> want an electric car. But I still wonder whether whether even if we are all driving electric cars and even if we are able to cut fossil fuel use substantially i wonder if that's even enough you know there may be more that we need to do isn't is 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 public transport a completely lost cause do you think uh i don't think so but but it's hard and so and so we've got to get there you've got to make public transport better than it is mm -hmm. and and that involves trade-offs too when i first got back to texas I tried to get to campus every day by taking the um, the express bus, but the express bus didn't go by my house. So I had to drive uh, miles to a, a bus pickup place and then, you know, to a park and ride. And then I would get on the bus and, you know, depending on what was going on, it might it was it was a rapid bus, but it was not a rapid bus. And so it had fewer stops, but I was spending an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half on a ride that could take me 25 minutes on a good day and never an hour and a half. And finally, uh, finally I said, when this improve, you know, when, when this improves, I'll come back. But, but right now it's not working for me. And so, uh, and so I got a damn parking space and drove my little smart car, which got about 45 miles a gallon on a good week and just tried to, you know, tried to be as good as I, as I could. Now, the Austin area is working on a project to have a, a light rail mass transit that would go from the north straight by the campus. If that got completed, I would be on the train in a heartbeat. But it's very controversial. I, I, I find myself wondering whether it'll be completed or how long it'll take. Right, because everything costs more than you think it will. And everything it takes longer than you think it will, and it certainly might not be complete. You know, it might not get me to campus in my lifetime, or certainly in my second career, because I'm already, you know, uh, relatively ancient. So you know, but but also, the route of the tracks that they're planning will, as, as the Austin is currently planning, will uh, drive straight through dirties which is Dirty Martin's Comeback Place, uh, a, a burger place that my mother ate at when she was at UT, and which you know we would go to together when, whenever I'd visit. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, it, 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 you know, we used to say progress is never convenient. Progress is not always convenient. Well, that's a terrible would, cost, though, to lose those hamburgers. It is a terrible cost to lose... <laughs> those institutions right right and that's happening all over austin and, yeah. and you know we can't turn the clock back i guess right i'm eating a lot less meat than i ever did but i will you know and i choose when i'm going to eat meat i want it to be good or at least you know right right i mean the uh, uh comforting in its way 
and dirties is one of the places that I choose. Uh, it, it feels good to be there. I meet people there when we're going to have lunch, if they can stand it. Um, so, you know, uh, so these are all trade-offs, but, but Wendy, I would, you know, I would love to see mass transit step up. The distances in Texas make things somewhat harder. Mm -hmm. And the fact that unlike London, we didn't start on it, you know, <laughs> 100 years 150 ago. 50 years ago or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's one of those things. This is the story you tell about how you ended up driving every day. It, it, I've I've heard that same story from so many people I know in different parts of the states. You know, friends in Philadelphia say the same thing. You know, uh, it, it's just too hard. You know, and and, and, it's it, true. and it's true I should be a better person. No, it's true in parts of Britain also, you know, and, and I'm sorry, I, I don't think it's reasonable to spend three hours commuting when you can spend 40 minutes commuting because the, the time is the one thing you can never get any more of. Yeah. Also, my parking space is really good. <laughs> well, what, what I'm, what, you know, I actually think a little differently than you do, which would be, my question would be why you didn't move close to campus. You know, like I actually do have friends in Miami who live literally across the street from their jobs at the University of Miami and they walk to work every day. And if they had lived anywhere else in Miami, they would be, they would be driving like you, you know, and you that's heard really anything about Austin real estate. No, I, I don't. And I was going to say when you were talking at the beginning of this about how Austin has changed, I was going to suggest that perhaps you should outline a little bit for the people who are not from Austin who might listen to this podcast. Okay. Uh, and, and I would expect John will weigh in on this as well. But when I attended Austin, uh, when I attended the University of Texas at Austin in the late 19, mid to late 1970s, uh, it was a school it was a it was a city. It had 40, 40,000 students, uh, and it was in a city that I think had two hundred fifty thousand people. I don't really remember how many. It was about two hundred fifty thousand, and it still felt like a small town. You know, it did because you could know everybody ways. in your part of town. You could know the campus as a city. You could know the people at the Capitol. My wife worked as a as a as a uh, as a member of uh, judicial committee staff at the Capitol. Um, dad had already been beat, but, you know, she still got good jobs. So, you know, we knew the, the various Austin communities we knew. And you knew the people in the arts because you would go to Raul's and the other clubs and you would know, you know, you would know the musicians. And so, uh, and so, you know, um, and those people, you know, many of them are still in town. They're just, they've just got different jobs, Right that Randy Franklin started a gallery called Yard Dog. And Mike Hall became an executive editor at Texas Monthly uh, after having been the lead of the Wild Seeds band. You know, so, yeah. so there's a lot of old Austin sort of hidden away here still, the, the human equivalents of dirties. But, but you could add, though, also that the musicians that were actually trying to make a living as musicians and continue to do so, unless they were like Willie Nelson, had to move. A lot of them have been moving out to Lockhart and, and other areas. Exactly right. Because as Austin went from being a town of 250,000 to being the 11th or 10th largest city in the United States, yes. a place so hot that moving to Austin was a theme of the office, the TV show that, you know, that South by Southwest, be, you know, became, you know, musical, uh, iconic musical um conference and concert venue all of these things happen and and austin boom didn't you know like i said we don't recognize the skyline it's it's packed traffic is terrible all that is true and because everybody wants to be here when i sold my house in the middle of a boom in new jersey and got a price that i never expected to get for a house anywhere um you know not quite Short Hills, New Jersey prices, but West Orange prices were surprisingly good. And it was a nice little bump. And I got to Austin and could not find a place here. Um, could yeah, not have... could not have swapped house for house in Austin. Yeah, it's tough. Which is uh, incredible tough in a way, because in, in many ways, it does seem to me that Texas is a really impractical place to move to. I mean, if you if you think about 
the world getting hotter every year? Why start in a place where it's 104 Fahrenheit the last time I was there? Yeah. You know, I, I, mean, I was, like I was running outside a lot. The what? What was the last? It seems, like, it seems like everybody should be moving to Minnesota or someplace. Yeah, but then you're in Minnesota. <laughs> hey, don't be mean. Minneapolis is a great town. Yeah. I like Minneapolis. I have wandered around Minneapolis. I have crossed the Mississippi there. I have I have taken long runs, you know, around town. I love, you know, it's a great state. It's a great city. Find me a good taco there. <laughs> well, if we're going by food, I'm not moving any place that doesn't have good Chinese food. Okay. Then I think you would do pretty well in Austin. Yeah, Austin. Austin no, has good I, Chinese know, the, food. No, the reason I can't live in Austin is I hate air conditioning. Yeah, well, that's a problem. If you've read the brilliant book that came out a little earlier this year by Jeff Goodell, The Heat Will Kill You First. Mm. One of the themes of that book is that he's from upstate New York. He fell in love with a woman who lived in Austin and he came to Austin. He'd always hated air conditioning and now he has to have air conditioning to survive. And what better person to write about for the mm -hmm. global heat crisis? Yeah. And, you know, than Jeff, uh, mm -hmm. who's also, you know, brilliantly accomplished reporter on climate change for, uh, for Rolling Stone, story after story after story. Uh, and 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 a, and a, just a really good guy. So um, and you know, I like to run every morning, and over the summer, I didn't. Wow, because the last I heard you were running at like five o'clock in the morning. And I was running at five or six in the morning, and I was doing that, but I shifted a little bit. I spent more time at a at a at a gym doing workouts. and I spent more time on UT campus at Gregory Gym, which has an air-conditioned running track. I just, I just, when you, when you get up in the morning and it's already in the eighties and, and that morning humidity is rising up, even in a drought, it was, it was, it was, it was, it, it causes you to reassess. So um, anyway, there, we also had the attraction of wanting to be close enough to the grandkids to be a part of their lives. So it wasn't like a huge sacrifice to say, we're not going to be, I would rather commute to work than commute to the kids. And, yeah, there's and, a lot and, to be said for that because, you know, you you want to be in a place where your your grandkid or your, your kid can call you up and say, hey, why don't you come over and we're going to watch a movie. Yeah. If and, you drive an and, hour and a half to do that, then it, it just kills it. And when I'm done here on this call today, I'm going to get in my car, drive back up to Pflugerville, which is where we live. And my wife and I will drive over to the elementary school where the grandkids go to school and we'll pick them up as we do every weekday nice. and, uh, and, and keep them occupied until it's time from, you know, to, to go home to their parents. So, you know, so, so that was worth being here for, but uh, even Pflugerville, a good 15 miles North of the center of town, even Pflugerville, we could only do a swap house for house basically we didn't make any money moving to texas you yeah, back on the subject of journalism students yes <laughs> being in texas and uh, texas you know i'm sure you have a number of students who are from some of the more conservative parts of the state and how do you address the ones who insist that alternate facts are a, a real thing which kind of is <laughs> a strange thing to say anyway but i've encountered so many young people who have been uh, indoctrinated by Fox News. So alternate facts are somehow real to them. How do you uh, deal with those kind of students or do you? Um, well, first of all, uh, first of all, I teach, I, I, the people who sign up for my covering the environment class generally understand what's going on with the environment. And so, uh, and so I don't end up with uh, with, I haven't yet in five semesters ended up with students who want to debate whether climate change is happening. You know, that's, that's not the sort nobody wants to waste his or her time for a semester getting into uh, taking an entire course and paying the tuition about something they don't believe in. Uh, maybe at some point I'll get a student who hopes to be a tendentious, you know, thinker of forbidden thoughts who, 
you know, uh, would be a better fit with, um, with uh, you know, with the University of Austin, the uh, um, the the conservative uh, institution that they're trying to start uh, with Barry Weiss. But frankly, those aren't the people that sign up for my class. I do have a general journalism course, re Introduction to Reporting, and that gets 100, 120 students a semester. And those students come from all across the spectrum. I've got a student this time who works in the Capitol for uh, for an East Texas Republican state representative. And um, and I make sure that everybody knows that uh, that I welcome their opinions in class. I want to hear their opinions in class. If I say something that they disagree with, I want them to disagree, whether in an email to bring it up or in a discussion in class. Uh, I, I invite this and uh, and I want them to understand that uh, that they can, I don't want to ever hear them say that they've shied away from a topic for a story because they write stories in the class, not papers. They shy away from a story because they think that I won't like the topic. So if you get your three sources and quote them correctly and lay out the facts in a solid way, that's a good story. Uh, and and I don't have to agree with your politics as long as the story itself is fair and accurate. That uh, that that you know, but but if you just you know, for example, if you just say climate change doesn't exist and you're not able to support it, we're going to have a discussion. And you know, and when I come to edit that story, I'm going to say here are the holes in this story. But, you know, but I but I invite them to disagree with me and I ask them to disagree with me. I, I wonder how social media has changed journalism. I mean, I have a sense of how it has, but I kind of wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, it certainly led reporters themselves to be a lot more vocal about in their opinions, uh, which has been yeah. a flashpoint in a lot of newsrooms. Uh, if you look at uh, the experience of Felicia Somnus at the Washington Post, you see that um, she she wanted to be herself online, and the uh, and the Post uh, really came down on her uh, in ways that um, that created you know a big controversy in the news community, saying you can't say this, you can't do that. Uh, at the Times, I worked under rules that said even when you are tweeting from your personal account, you are still going to be treated as you are representing the New York Times and you will be treated as representing the New York Times. And so um, and so you could you, know, you could you could cause trouble for the institution. By I mean, by, it's almost like you're being asked to pretend to be objective because we know nobody's really truly objective, right? Um, yes, but that's what we ask of judges as well. It's, you know, nobody asked me not to have a life or to have an opinion. What they said was, build your stories in a way that somebody reading it will say, okay, well, I've been informed. Um, you know, I tell my students, you might have an opinion, but as long as you're covering the various stakeholders, for lack of a better term, and what they say, and not letting people get away with lies, not simply you know promoting two sides as equal when there's not really two equal sides in the fight, then uh, then you're doing the business of journalism. That does um, tend to be a, a problem in journalism, uh, the both sidesism as they call it. This, the, this idea that you have to present both sides of a question, but if one side is you alluded to this when we were talking about climate change. If one side is completely and clearly wrong, does it deserve the same weight, you know, in the in the story or in the narrative? That is a classroom discussion that we have. <laughs> and where do you come down on that? Um, I tell them, you know, I tell them that they still have an obligation to. Uh, to write in a balanced way, but not with false balance. I say that by the choice of, uh, I'll take them through stories that talk about um, like uh, anti-trans rules being passed by school boards. And I'll look at how the Texas Tribune covers it. And I'll say, look, 
these people, they're being quoted because they're the policymakers. They're the ones passing the rules. You have to have them in the story. You can't just, you know, you can't just say, you can't just quote the good guys in this. You have to explain how this rule came about and what these people are saying. But, uh, but you know, but it was very clear from the way the story, which was, you know, written in a very fair way. It was also very clear once you read through it that uh, that um, that the, it seemed to me and it seemed to my students that the people who were passing these rules were working from a political motivation to to you know to 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 score points, and that the people on the other side were saying these children are suffering because of rules like this, and uh, and I said no, you don't. You know, you're not going to go in. You're not going to say. And the shitheads then said, right? But but by the quote you use, and the order in which you place these things, and especially who gets the last word, and how do you frame the discussion, uh, that that um, that you're not working without opinion, that you're making judgments, and that your judgment in presenting the news gets the idea across now in a in a world where people basically write with sledgehammers that might feel too subtle but um and i tell them there is such a thing as uh as highly opinionated journalism it's not you know this class we're teaching you how to write a straight news story and it has these attributes and you need to be able to do this before you do anything else but let me also introduce you to the work of uh, of people who write with fire and anger, and you know, and and who uh, and who make the case. So you know, I let them know there's more than one type of journalism, but in this class, you're going to be able to do this, if that makes sense. Well, I'm sorry to say that we've run out of time, and this has been a, a great and fascinating discussion, John. We hope you'll join us again sometime. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for having me. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.